It's Wednesday, December 15. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Carol Francis. Plans are underway to expand Jamaica's hospital and health infrastructure to improve health outcomes and patient experiences. Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton outlined the long-term strategic investment in the future of the island's health infrastructure during Tuesday's sitting of Parliament. We get more from Simone Absalom Gale. Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton says the ministry plans to build out the country's health infrastructure over the next three years. He says most of it predates the country's independence. If you look at the size of Jamaica's population back in 1962, uh, official statistics says approximately 1.6 million Jamaicans. Today we're looking at just under 3 million uh, Jamaican citizens. The truth is, we have really not done much to improve our health infrastructure. Minister Tufton says work on several facilities is set to begin in the first quarter of the next financial year. As part of partnerships through multilateral agreements, bilateral agreements, GOJ funding, or gifts that we have received from our bilateral partners, we have committed, Madam Speaker, to build out over the next three years health infrastructure valued at US 200 to approximately 236 million US dollars, Madam Speaker. And this is to build out a public health infrastructure over that period of time. Madam Speaker, this represents the largest investment in health infrastructure since independence in 1962, Madam Speaker, being undertaken by this government, this administration. He also notes the lack of maintenance on established health facilities, highlighting one such facility that is being repaired. We have done a not so good job at maintaining that infrastructure. And I think Cornwall Regional demonstrates the, 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 the consequences of that given the fact that that building collapsed before it has gotten the type of attention that it deserves. The minister says Maypen and Moko in Clarendon, Greater Portmore, St. Jago Park and Old Harbour in St. Catherine are a few of the areas set to benefit from the project. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. The start of the winter tourist season is December 15. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett is optimistic that the island will have a strong winter tourist season. Based on the steady inflows of visitors, Mr. Bartlett says the projection is Jamaica will welcome 1.6 million visitors at the end of 2021 and amass over $2 billion in earnings. The Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association projects an average of 65% occupancy in hotels across the island. Persons wanting their favorite cuts of meat smoked this Christmas can do so at the Scientific Research Council, the SRC. The per pound cost of meat processing, including GCT, is minimal. Marlon Samuels has more on the processing and smoking of meats by the SRC over the festive season. Jamaica has a rich tradition of smoking food. The salting and smoking of meats are culturally important. Maroons would transform cuts of meat into delicious dishes by smoking. Meat that is processed has been treated by smoking, curing, or adding salt to lengthen the shelf life. Some say it also improves the taste of the meat. Processed meat and poultry products like bacon, sausage, ham, and smoked chicken are often consumed over the Christmas holidays. Jamaicans now have the means to easily transform fresh cuts of meat and poultry products into processed meats. Courtesy of the Scientific Research Council, SRC, they can drop off their meat to be processed and smoked by the SRC at a minimal cost per pound. Each meat is individually tagged, so the chance of clients' meats being mixed up is minimal. SRC branded meat products are also on sale while stocks last. For the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. The Labour and Social Security Ministry is calling all job seekers in Trelawney, St. Mary and Hanover to participate in its upcoming job fair. 
It's scheduled to take place December 28 to 30, 2021. Director of the Electronic Labor Exchange, ELE, in the ministry, Lyndon Ford, says individuals who lost their jobs due to the pandemic and others trained in hospitality, as well as persons from the disabled community, should visit the MLSS employment portal and register through the Labor Market Information System, LMIS, at www.lmis.gov.jm. That's www.lmis.gov.jm. December 26th, Boxing Day, is a public holiday in Jamaica. This year, the date is on a Sunday. Labor and Social Security Minister Carl Samuda says by virtue of his powers under Section 7 of the Holidays Public General Act, he has appointed Monday, December 27, 2021, as the public general holiday. 77 countries have now reported cases of the Omicron variant of COVID-19. The World Health Organization says the variant is spreading at an unprecedented rate and is urging all to remain vigilant. Head of the World Health Organization, WHO, Dr. Tedros Gebesis, says compared to others, the Omicron is the fastest spreading COVID-19 variant. We're concerned that people are dismissing Omicron, Omicron as mild. Surely, we have learned by now that we underestimate this virus at our peril. Even if Omicron does cause less severe disease, the sheer number of cases could once again overwhelm unprepared health systems. The WHO boss notes the increased use of vaccine boosters by some countries, but says he's concerned about the implications. It's clear that as we move forward, boosters could play an important role, especially for those at highest risk of severe disease and death. Let me be very clear. WHO is not against boosters. We are against inequity. Our main concern is to save lives everywhere. It is a question of prioritization. Who gets what vaccines in what order? The order matters. Giving boosters to groups at low risk of severe disease or death simply endangers the lives of those at high risk who are still waiting for their primary dose because of supply constraints. Dr. Gabresius is urging countries to act swiftly to rein in transmission, protect their health systems, and warns against complacency. It's not vaccines instead of masks. It's not vaccines instead of distancing. It's not vaccines instead of ventilation or hand hygiene. Do it all. Do it consistently. Do it well. The WHO says early data suggests Omicron is more transmissible than the Delta variant of COVID-19. A real-world study from South Africa has shown Two doses of the Pfizer vaccine was 70% effective in stopping a severe illness from Omicron. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. In 2018, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the JSE, was voted the world's best performing stock exchange. It was voted the fifth best performing stock exchange in the world for 2019, according to a report from Bloomberg. To get the latest stock market movements and other updates, we go to the Business Report with Gabriel Thompson. In foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, December 14, the U.S. dollar sold for an average $154.75. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $120.93. The pound sterling traded for $206.82, and the euro sold for an average $177.20. In Tuesday's trading session, the JSE combined index declined by 1,122 points to close at under 400,000 units. 
Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 87 stocks of which 31 advanced, 46 declined, and 10 traded firm. The junior market index advanced by 5 points to close at over 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for Barita Investments Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share, and Derrimont Trading Company Limited. Stocks declined for 1834 Investments Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Trading firm were CAC 2000 9.5% Preference Shares, Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares, and G West Corporation Limited Ordinary Shares. Community and Workers of Jamaica CCU Deferred Share was the volume leader with over 4 million units, followed by Honeybun Limited with over 3.1 million units and Carreras Limited with over 2.3 million units. In, mar in market data for oil, prices fell for a third straight day on Wednesday on growing expectations that supply growth will outpace demand growth next year even though the Omicron coronavirus variant is not seen curbing mobility as sharply as earlier COVID-19 variants. Brent crude futures fell 91 cents or 1.2% to $72.79 a barrel after losing 69 cents on Tuesday. West Texas intermediate crude futures fell $1.05 or 1.5% to $69.68 a barrel after losing 56 cents in the previous session. The International Energy Agency, IEA, on Tuesday said a surge in COVID-19 cases with the emergence of the Omicron variant will dent global demand for oil at the same time that crude output is set to increase, especially in the United States, with supply set to exceed demand through at least the end of next year. And with that, we close this Wednesday edition of the Business Report inside the news on BBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. Pleasant viewing. In today's Living Healthy Report, Dr. Heather Lawson Myers of Ligony Family Dental gets transparent on the importance of dental x rays. HD coming to you from the middle of the Hope River. Welcome to another episode of HD's Jazz. Today we will be talking about what lies underneath. mom used to tell countless stories about her and her brothers and sisters going to the river, lifting up rocks to get crayfish. Now, here's the problem that I have with that. I don't know what's under the rock. Maybe it's my training, but I would rather have some idea as to what's beneath before lifting up the rock. In the dental office, there are a lot of things that you cannot see with the naked eye. For instance, what does the bone look like? Is it very dense or not? Are the roots of the teeth straight? Are they curved? Are they bulbous? All of those things help to decide how the treatment should go and the order in which things should flow. What about a tooth that's decayed? Sometimes you can't even see the decay unless you look on an x-ray. Is it close to the nerve? Is it far from the nerve? Will the teeth need fillings or will they need root canals? All these decisions can be made once you can clearly see what's going on beneath. We tend to rely on symptoms. If it's hurting, well, maybe we should get it checked out. If you're not feeling any pain, you assume that there's no issue. But a lot of times, sinister things can be happening for a long time before you see any symptoms. So it's always a good idea 
to have a thorough dental checkup that includes radiographs or x-rays. There are two dental views that we rely on. A periapical radiograph shows the tooth from the biting surface all the way to the end of the root. If there are any abnormalities in the bone, if there are any abscesses at the root, that's a good view to tell me what's going on in that regard. Bite wing x-rays show what's going on in between the teeth. Small cavities that begin between the teeth can be very easily detected with bite wing radiographs. There are different types of x-rays. The orthodontist or the oral surgeon may not be well served with a full mouth series of x-rays, but they may do another type of x-ray known as the panorex. That shows spatial relationship, where the roots of the teeth are in relation to the sinus, or the nerve which runs below the bottom teeth, or where the roots are in relation to the back of the mandible. These are things that that kind of x-ray can tell you. Very valuable information in determining how best to treat. There's always the concern about exposure to radiation, and it's a valuable concern. But we always have to weigh the risk versus the benefit. And in the dental office, the benefits far outweigh the risks. Let me explain why. The radiation that you're exposed to in a dental office pales in comparison to, say, a chest x-ray. And the level of radiation that you're exposed to in the dental office is very similar to being outdoors in the sun for an hour or two. So as you can see, the benefits of dental x-rays far outweigh the risks. So it's very important to know what lies beneath and the use of dental x-rays is an excellent and efficient way to ensure that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt to ensure proper treatment. Listen, catch us next time on FYI, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. See you next time on HD's Jazz. <laughs>
It must be a natural relationship. The president recently announced the implementation of a pilot system, an electronic speed monitoring system, targeting motorists and signaling an end of the police-operated speed guns. This system will be installed along the new Eccles Mandela and Diamond Eccles Highway. There are certain technological features that will be incorporated in that infrastructure that will help policing, containerized outposts, Speeding cameras that will not only be telling us speed, but will be showing us who is wearing seat belts and who are not wearing seat belts. Then it will give us advanced information. You will be able to type in a particular vehicle number and type that you're looking for. And the system through the cameras will give you detection. And this is a pilot. This will be taken all across the country. The government is also looking to invest in assets and a plan is being formulated to utilize the country's waterways as the first line of defense. President Ali assured that the welfare and salary issues of the officers will continue to be addressed. He also spoke of his appreciation of the positive response and commitment he has gotten from the police force. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Isanella Patwo. Employees at the Grenada Port Authority could be back on the picket line if their employer fails to meet their demands. The Technical and Allied Workers Union said the Grenada Port Authority had up to the end of Tuesday to avoid major industrial action by meeting its commitments to its workers. Labour representative in the Senate, Andre Lewis, issued a warning to the management of the Grenada Port Authority to settle industrial matters or he warned the outcome will be on them. Grenada Ports Authority has been given up to today, the end of the working day today, to resolve this matter. This is not a threat to you, Mr. Deputy President, but given where we are with COVID and everything else, that whatever takes place on the port after today is totally in the hands of the management. Workers of the Grenada Port Authority did not report to their usual workstation on Monday as they were engaged in industrial action outside the authority's headquarters. Lewis, who is the president general of the Grenada Technical and Allied Workers Union, was on the front line on Monday with employees, protesting for what they say is the authority's inability to resolve outstanding issues that date as far back as 2019. An outstanding matter in relation to Comrade Dennis Grew and others that went before the Ministry for Labor. The Labour Commissioner, together with the Department of Public Administration, investigated the matter, found in favour of the Union. The Union accepted the recommendation, although it was not everything that we were arguing for. The Port Authority, by way of letter dated 11th August 2021, wrote to the Labour Commissioner accepting the recommendation, thanking the Labour Commissioner for resolving the matter. And then all things seem to have just gone downhill. Um, where they, have no, they are now saying that they are no longer interested in the recommendation. He outlined other outstanding issues that contributed to Monday's protest action. For 2020, the bonus that were paid to the workers were below that which is normally paid. The collective agreement makes provision for discussions on the matter. We have written to the port. Up to now, they have not gotten back to us to give us an explanation for this matter. Lewis said he can't understand the management of the Grenada Port Authority stance. There has been industrial action on the port, right? That's why I've been upset yesterday. We can't understand for how the like of it that a government entity in particular, and anybody, could sign accepting a recommendation from the Minister of the Ministry for Labor, signing that they accept, meeting with the organization to work on payment and then trying to renege on it. I mean, we wouldn't want to say that that seems to be the norm. Okay, remember the issue of the MOU, the pension and the MOU, all right? We hope that this is not a norm because there will be the appropriate response. Lewis made a statement during his contribution to the 2022 budget presentation on Tuesday. Cherry and Blackman Stephen. GBN News. Over in Trinidad and Tobago, Public Utilities Minister Marvin Gonzalez says the Water and Sewage Authority's strategic plan will be revealed in the coming months. More from Terry and Brown Campbell. The minister spoke highly of the Community Water Improvement Program 
as an example to the authorities of the workers. In 2022, the country is going to hear for the very first time of our strategic plan to improve water supply all across Trinidad and Tobago. CWIP is just a small component of that overall strategy to bring water across the lengths and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. Minister Gonzalez added that this transformation of the utility will negatively impact water trucking and other companies. If we provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with an efficient water supply by all the available groundwater that we have in Trinidad and Tobago, then there is no business for desalination water in Trinidad and Tobago. He said the Guayco Terminal project cost $200,000 to complete and questioned the treatment of the residents in the area who were left to languish without a water supply. This project, impactful as it is, as we've heard from the residents, people not having water for over 20 and 25 years, a school for the very first time being connected to the, to the grid. The minister added that 16 other communities and 65,000 residents had already benefited from the projects completed by CWIP. Terry Ann Brown Campbell, TTT News. And in sports, we are in the creases with cricket. West Indies were edged out by nine runs by hosts Pakistan in Karachi on Tuesday in their second 2020 international match. The defeat means a serious loss for the Windies, who were defeated in the first match with a final fixture set for Thursday. Chasing 173 for victory, the West Indies were carried early on by a maiden half century of 67 of 43 balls from opener Brandon King. But they lost six wickets in quick succession for 46 runs to find themselves reeling on 131 for eight at the end of the 17th over. They were dismissed with 163 runs on the board. And that's our package. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place, for more news and sports right here on PBCJ, the People's Station.